Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to our second Global Voices webinar, where we are addressing various aspects of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. As you know, the world has less than 10 years to meet over 200 unique indicators connected to the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals. This is a huge undertaking, to say the least especially given the serious setbacks caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Chinwei F. Young and I'm Assistant Dean. I'm in the Office of International Studies and Programs at Michigan State University. The purpose of these webinars is to highlight the work our faculty, students, and partners are doing in support of the SDGs and to provide examples and suggestions for how individuals and institutions can do their part to contribute to the attainment of these goals. During the inaugural webinar last November, we explored the topic of food security in a COVID-19 era with a focus on SDGs 1, no poverty, 2, zero hunger, and 11, sustainable cities and communities. Today's topic focuses on decent work and economic growth with a focus on SDG 8. We have a very exciting and diverse panel of speakers. And um, our moderator, Dr. Leo Murembia, seems to be having some technical difficulties. So we are going to get started in his absence. And um, if he comes in, he will join us. So let me just uh, pull up. Um, While I'm, I'm pulling up the, the questions for our panel, I'd like to ask our panelists to go ahead and introduce themselves. And I'd like to start with Devin. Just take a minute or two or 30, min 30 seconds or a minute to introduce yourself. Good morning, everybody. Um, I am a fourth year senior here at Michigan State University, um, majoring in humanities pre-law with a minor in leadership of organizations. And I also work for the College of Arts and Letters in the Excel Network as a career peer intern. Thank you guys for having me. Thanks, Devin. Um, Carrie? Good morning, everyone. I'm Carrie Rosengana. I am the CEO at Capital Area Michigan Works. We are a workforce development agency that serves the tri-county region in Michigan of the capital area, which is Ingham, Eaton, and Clinton counties, so both rural and urban in nature. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be a part of the conversation. Thanks, Carrie. Colleen? Hi everyone, my name is Kaleem Ahmed and I'm a final year medical student at the Al Khan University in Pakistan. Um, I'm currently acting as CEO of a local startup by the name of Rinder, which aims to connect researchers across the globe, both in the industry and in academia. And I'm the founder for uh, the Student Task Force Against COVID-19, which has been working in Pakistan to uh, assist healthcare workers uh, in this pandemic. Looking forward to speaking to you all. Thank you, Karim. And uh, finally, Mina. Yes, good afternoon from Brussels, uh, Europe. Uh, my name is Mina, and I work at Junior Achievement Europe, which is a um, nonprofit uh, organization working in 40 countries in Europe and uh, 100 countries globally, equipping young people um, at all levels of education with entrepreneurship, work readiness, and financial literacy skills and uh, supporting their transition from education to employment. Thank you, Mina. And I am happy to announce that uh, Dr. Miranda is with us and I will allow him to introduce himself and take it from there. Hey, can we actually, before we do that, can we have um, Sazini introduce herself? Oh, so, sorry, Sazini. I am so sorry about that. Sazini, yes. please introduce yourself. I am Sazini Mojapilo. I am the Group Head of Corporate Citizenship and Community Investments at uh, the APSA Group Limited. APSA is a, a bank that's operational across uh, Africa and also has presence in the US and in the UK. My portfolio is responsible for our social license to operate as a bank, so I primarily drive our social impact strategies across the continent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Suzini. I was shuffling between two screens. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you. Leo, please. Yes, um, I, am, I, I, I apologize um, um, 
I am embarrassed actually. <laughs> um, uh, I tried to go to my office at Michigan State uh, because you know the house is full of people. Um, um, and then I got into uh, some um, traffic. Uh, but anyway, I'm here um, and um, uh, I'm happy to uh, take over and uh, moderate this uh, discussion. Um, so my name is uh, Leonidas Muremja. I am an uh, 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 assistant professor of economics at Michigan State University, um, um, specializing in international development um, for Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, and uh, Latin America. Um, I am also, um, I work for the state of Michigan as an economic specialist, uh, specializing, specializing in labor market information issues. Um, so I work with um, workforce develop, development developers and economic developers, uh, giving them access to information about uh, the labor market of, of the state of Michigan. Uh, having said that, um, I um, can, can you, uh, Chinue, tell me how far you've gone in terms of? Nothing. I've, we've just introduced, I've, I've asked the panelists to introduce themselves and then you came in. So we can start from the top. Okay. Um, I do remember that Kalim uh, was going to be a little bit late. No, they're all here. They are all here. Okay, great. Um, so, um, the uh, Chinue must have told you already about the purpose of this panel discussion. Um, um, we, we're looking at uh, the uh, globe, uh, the um, uh, sustainable um, development goal eight, um, and how to, how um, the strategies to create jobs. Um, for especially for young people around the world. Um, and so we know that COVID-19, uh, which is a global uh, pandemic has affected us in many different ways. Um, here in the US and uh, in Michigan in particular, we know that women and young people have been um, most affected by this pandemic because of uh, their uh, disproportionate representation in the industries that were affected by the shutdowns. Uh, these are industries in leisure and hospitality. So um, I would like to ask each of the panelists uh, to take a few minutes to share how the pandemic has affected you as an individual, uh, you as a member of a community, and or your organization, okay? So I'm gonna start, uh, I'm, I'm gonna apologize for Devin, Devin uh, who's the youngest in the, uh, among the panelists, uh, but I think that's what we need to do because we're talking about youth. So I'm gonna talk, I start with Devin. Um, Devin, can you start the conversation? Sure, thank you, doctor. Uh, well, I would like to just start off by saying that um, I definitely was impacted uh, by the pandemic, um, one of the most regretful things, I mean, I've been blessed enough to not have lost anyone close to me. However, uh, you know, I did lose a very lucrative internship opportunity uh, with um, Blue Cross Blue Shield that would have presumably led to something uh, that would have turned into a position post-graduation because I am a senior. Uh, that's something that I kind of, you know, look back on, but, you know, we can always figure it out and work hard towards uh, changing that. Um, but as it relates to, I would just say school and community, uh, things have definitely changed. Of course, we cannot be in person. Um, and so that is kind of a communicative uh, difference because um, things almost don't seem the same. Uh, you know, you're just doing things to do them, not because you're necessarily getting the same things out of them. There's something about person-to-person um, -person interaction that makes a huge difference. Um, as it relates to organizations, uh, one thing that really comes to mind is uh, my extracurricular activity, which was mainly uh, Rising Black Men, which is a um, 
on-campus organization that is geared towards um, uniting young black males and first-generation college students on campus and uh, giving them opportunity to learn from each other and you know just have a safe space here at a, a predominantly white institution. And the events that we had and the um, impact that we had in our own personal community was huge. Um, it still goes on today, but there's something about being in person that makes a huge difference. Um, additionally, um, I'm, I'm also a part of an organization, uh, Kappa um, Alpha Pi, which is a, um, excuse me, uh, it's also a, a pre-law fraternity. And all of these things were very community involved. However, we have in both of them found ways to still um, interact. So it's not in person, but we are still doing a lot of the activities we would have done uh, normally. But there is something about that human interaction that we are definitely missing is what I'd say. Great. Um, so I, I understand your, um, your situation. I have uh, uh, a son of your age um, and you also missed uh, an internship. Um, we know that with the state of Michigan um, uh, civil service, uh, when the, pandemics, uh, the pandemic started, we, uh, we were told to um, stop every internship so I have students that were going to be interns in my office and we had to stop that. So I, I do understand what you're saying. Uh, so I, I'm gonna go to, uh, since we're talking about Michigan, I'm gonna go to Carrie and ask her what, uh, the same question. So please. Thanks Leo, I appreciate it. So I'll start by just very briefly talking about individually the impact that's been had. So I am a working professional who is also the parent of a young child whose school was impacted by COVID. So um, in terms of this question and the disproportionate effect it's had on women and youth, I've certainly felt that for many individuals who are my age and have children, whether they are a, a working man or a working woman, they've been impacted by their students um, in school and their children being home with them and trying to do virtual school while you are also balancing your work life too. So that's been certainly an interesting journey to walk through, but it's certainly it provided an opportunity to learn adaptation skills, which are always critically important and some flexibility, and also giving some grace to all of us as we're working through this together, um, because we really are on this journey together. As the CEO of an organization, I just became CEO in July. So I became CEO in the midst of a pandemic for our organization, which has provided a really unique transition. Fortunately, I'd been a member of our organization previously as the COO for five years before this. So I, I knew a lot of the agency background, but what we've had to do as an agency, we traditionally provided workforce development resources in a face-to-face -face dynamic, meaning we would provide workshops for individuals to work on resume skills, work on their interview techniques, and directly assisting them through meetings and one-on-one -on -one settings. When COVID hit, we had to physically close our buildings and transition and pivot to providing all of our services in a virtual format, which was something that really we had long-term planned to do but we had to get it up and running very quickly. So we had to move a lot of our resources onto our website. We've heavily utilized our Facebook um, presence as well as YouTube channels so that we can make sure we're providing workshops to the audience where they can achieve them and engage with them in that virtual dynamic setting. But we also, for our youth specifically, have had to look at allowing for the youth to be able to come in and meet with their staff. We know the youth we work with are at risk already to be a part of our program, meaning they are considered low income individuals. Some of them are homeless and sleeping on couches of their family members or friends. Um, so they have a lot of barriers already that they're facing to either stay in school or to try to finish their high school equivalency. So we've had to allow for some face-to-face -face interactions so that they can continue to have the supports they need on that really foundational level um, for security to be met and to ensure that they have that support that they need. Great. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I appreciate um, your input. Um, some uh, st stereotypes that, you know, I grew up outside the United States. Uh, before I came to the United States, I had this idea 
that everybody in the United States is rich, is educated, uh, has no unemployment issues. Um, and it's, it's when I got here and started working that I actually realized that we are all humans and we have many problems, uh, same problems. And so uh, having said that, let's move to other parts of the world and see how they are dealing with the same issue. So I'm gonna go to South Africa with Sazini um, and ask her what the same question. <laughs> well, th thank you for that and uh, welcome Leo. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm um, at, a, at an individual or personal level, I'm a mother of three. So I think the biggest impact firstly was having to work from home and um, schooling at home. So you, we became instant teachers. I have got a, a grade eight, um, a 14 year old, a 10 year old and an eight year old. And I had to now facilitate and support the, the schooling at home at the same time, getting to many Zoom calls and Microsoft team meetings, something that was all new to us and try and uh, steer the ship forward. So it was really unprecedented, a lot of uncertainty from a home front, from a work front. Uh, we were not sure, but um, um, in my role, one of the first, um, the immediate focus was humanitarian support at, a, at all country, in all the countries. And I think that was the first time I actually realized the impact of uh, COVID when you see that with the lockdowns, people have to now work from home the impact on this micro and small enterprises was something we had never ever anticipated. They are so they're basically in the service industry. So they rely on human contact and selling to people. So when you lock down countries, you're telling people to stay at home and work from home. They cannot work from home. They rely on human interaction. We had oh, millions of people who then moved from, who were quite, who were in a vulnerable state, but moved into a very poor state and could not feed themselves. So we had to do quite a lot of food drives, food parcels, and that was a big chunk of money that went towards that as an organization, but as government as well. We, the government set up what we called the Solidarity Fund, where corporates like ours would donate and try and um, buy food and distribute food. We realized that people were actually not dying from COVID, but from hunger. Uh, and that was the case for most of the African countries that we're operating in. But linked to that with schools closing, I think it's something that um, we didn't quite anticipate. Most of our schools in South Africa and on the continent are not digitally enabled. They are face-to-face -face delivery. There's no blended solution. So when schools closed, we would say the privileged schools went online and 90% of the schools in most countries, kids sat at home and did nothing. And we had to start thinking of how we can continue the education curriculum with the rolling lockdowns taking two, three months, the academic year was in crisis. And we were also part of the thinking around that and how we solution for it. Obviously universities as well, not all of them are digitally enabled. Um, and university students were sitting at home, not back in school. Um, so those were the big challenges that we faced on the continent and as an, as an, as an organization looking at how we can support our country, support our industries, and try and look at how we, we, we drive that forward. And with the rising number of infections, uh, we could see we saw the strain in the hospital sector um, and realizing that actually we're not medically equipped or capable to manage this kind of virus. And I think that was the case across the continent. And um, as an organization, we tried to find ways to um, make a meaningful contribution and also support our own employees to, to continue, particularly given that their children were some, most of the children were excluded and sitting at home. So I'd say the impact of uh, COVID on, at an individual level was felt personally, but more so as a citizen in a country and uh, my portfolio in the bank, which requires us to make, uh, to respond accordingly to, to such a, a huge humanitarian crisis. Thank you very much, Sazini, for the input. Um, um, it's, uh, it's humbling to uh, learn that. I mean, I knew that, but, uh, you know, hearing it from somebody who has pretty, is in the fields is, is very, very humbling. And I wish my, my children was, were actually listening to this because I'm struggling just to get them 
to, to get up to go online, <laughs> um, to, to, to get online, they have access to all that um, technology, but you know, in places where they actually don't have access to that technology, that becomes a big issue. Um, so we're gonna go to Pakistan uh, with Kalim and ask the same question of how the country is dealing with this pandemic. Um, thank you, Dr. Leo. Uh, I think I do want to mirror your sort of sentiment in that it's hard to get people to shift online, uh, especially uh, in the school system where I've seen it with my own brothers. I feel like one brother was able to get up and attend school online and the other was just unwilling to make the extra effort to get out of bed, log in and, uh, you know, engage digitally. And I think that that's a, something we see across the spectrum, um, whether that's uh, at the primary school level or all the way up to university, medical school, et cetera. Um, for me personally, what, what we noticed was that there was a very urgent need um, for the youth to mobilize in our country. And we felt that there was an impact that young people could have and did have during, uh, during the first few months, especially when things were quite chaotic. Uh, speaking from our personal experience, um, the our schools and universities all locked down on March 13th. And on March 14th, our organization Stack was had begun mobilizing uh, to work together, to come together on things like mental health, uh, telemedicine for critical care, supporting doctors digitally, um, uh, making information, sort of curating the vast amount of uh, information that was out there, sort of bringing it to a forefront, dissecting it, actually trying to present to people what is needed for them to know, what can they follow, what they can't follow. Because in the beginning, as I'm sure you all know, there was, an, there was a lot of misinformation. And I think that that was probably the biggest hurdle to progress during this pandemic. I think that sort of activity from our side was mirrored across the nation with a lot of established youth groups pivoting on their primary missions to adapt and be flexible in this pandemic and to facilitate pandemic related crises. We had organizations like the First Response Initiative Pakistan, which has traditionally been involved in training first responders uh, for uh, acute crises, and they started helping with pandemic related equipment needs. They started uh, assisting doctors, raising funds for patients and for uh, medical equipment. And that's organizations like uh, them, Karachi Relief Trust uh, came up. They're the ones who actually helped in the pandemic, uh, the earthquakes in 2005 and played a critical role. So they were able to adapt from their previous agenda and come up. And then we actually had a lot of support from the government where the government created um, pathways for youth to be involved. Whether those pathways were successful or not, is uh, it's, a, it's a debatable topic, but there was push from above. There was a grassroots level pull as well for a movement where the youth could feel engaged, where the youth could feel involved. From a business and community point of view, there was a big hit in the country. Um, and we felt it's, it's especially in the younger population, which was looking for early jobs. Um, and I think Devin uh, touched upon this as well, where a lot of people couldn't get internships. A lot of people uh, missed out on first job opportunities, especially with the cut down on uh, salary, the cut down on employment and furloughing of a lot of people. There was um, ripple down effects in homes that we were able to quite tangibly see outside, uh, inside and outside our social circles. Uh, you have to understand that Pakistan is a typically um, diverse uh, financially, so you could see that effect across various levels. Thank you. Great. Um, to, to Europe, um, uh, Mina, um, please give us a, a you know, quick overview of how the pandemic has affected you and, and, and the community. Thank you. I, I think at the individual level, my experience was uh, quite similar to others uh, in other parts of the world. I'm also a working mother. And so uh, I've come to appreciate uh, now that we're out of the deep lockdown, uh, the small things that I took for granted, uh, like sending kids off to school in the morning. Um, as an organization, Junior Achievement works in schools. So uh, the, the, the school closures that uh, unfolded last spring uh, had really a dramatic effect. It was really um, 
fascinating and, and scary to, to follow the rapid uh, developments uh, uh, across all countries in Europe that were one after the other closing all their, all their schools, um, uh, keeping children at home. And for us as, a, as an organization, it meant that all our programs were put to a halt. The 4 million students uh, that we train every year uh, across all levels of education from one day to the other didn't have access to, to the programs. And so it was a huge disruption uh, for our network, for all the local organizations that work uh, in, the, in the schools with 140,000 teachers and business mentors. And um, of course, it was also um, a, a possibility for innovation. So we rapidly, uh, our organizations invented new ways of uh, staying in touch with the students um, and, uh, and teachers and delivering online programs and tools. But it was, it was a hectic moment of improvisation and we are still on that path. Uh, but I think the biggest impact really has been on the youth uh, itself. So in Europe, uh, we see what I think in other parts of the world as well, this crisis has really widened the gap between those who, who are more vulnerable, who, who are lacking uh, opportunities and resources and who risk really falling uh, away both from, um, from education and from the economic opportunities. So uh, this is something that for, for Junior Achievement as an organization has become an even more urgent priority is really to focus on this group of, uh, of young people uh, to ensure that, th that this, this disadvantaged group of young people doesn't become a huge uh, and growing group uh, and that we get back on track into providing more opportunities uh, to all young people. Great. Um, I very much appreciate that. Um, um, so we are now going to focus on, on uh, the Sustainable Development Goal 8, and especially the target um, uh, point of 8.6, uh, which states that by 2020, which is last year, <laughs> we should substantially reduce the proportion of youth not in employment, education, or training. Uh, I would like you to use examples uh, from your own context to show how the pandemic has affected this goal and to give your opinions and how we can get back on track by 2030. So again, I'm gonna start with Devin. Um, um, we know that many graduating young adults are finding themselves in a situation where hiring has frozen and or postponed indefinitely. What advice do you give them for the short and long, long term? Thank you again. <clears throat> well, um, since I work as a career peer intern for uh, the College of Arts and Letters, which is MSU's uh, liberal arts uh, college, um, I have started out this job primarily just working with students on things like resume and cover letter reviews and building. And since the pandemic, my job has extended because it has turned into more so workshops and presentations to our students um, and uh, I guess you would say affiliated organizations with the college. So things like uh, AIGA for the graphic design students um, and perhaps our philosophy organization, that's like extracurricular. Um, and I just did one yesterday and I think there is a, there is a uh, expressed worry about getting or gaining employment or internship experience uh, in the pandemic. Um, but quite honestly, my message has been being marketable is very, mu very much important. So um, believe it or not, um, MSU and you know, Big Ten universities and universities all alike have uh, a lot of resources for our students um, that we don't necessarily tap into because we haven't had to, we didn't feel like we needed to at one point. But there is a lot of uh, career uh, advising. There are a lot of opportunities to attend certain meetings, be a part of certain organizations that are uh, definitely um, something that we should be taking advantage of. But in addition to the, the resources we have, it's going to take um, a certain amount of, um, I would just say, aggression. Uh, believe it or not, you know, there is some advantages to the fact that you can stand out in a situation like this because many people do feel uh, less enthused about being active and being proactive in a situation like this. 
So being prepared is the first thing. Um, you know, kind of taking it into your own hands and believing that you can will lead to other opportunities um, and just understanding that advantage. Uh, that doesn't necessarily answer your question about what does that do for everyone, but for those of us who can muster up the ability um, and the resources, we should definitely take advantage of that. Um, but quite honestly, I think that there needs to be an intentional um, change of our structures as it relates to organizations, businesses, corporate organizations, and universities alike. Um, for helping students. Um, because at the end of the day, there is talent uh, in these universities that need the people uh, who they try and hire and uh, students need jobs also. So I think um, working in tandem uh, with, you know, uh, universities, making sure they can market their students and giving them all the resources they can and giving them very little excuse to not um, tap into them. Um, as well as these organizations coming out and, uh, you know, realizing that they do need these young people um, to change and continuously grow. All those three things um, with the ingression of students coming together, I think we should be able to make something work. This is all theoretical, uh, but I think that's where we need to start. Thank you, Devin. Um, so, um, as we, you know, as we know, um, every level of government is trying to think of ways to what is happening, what is going to happen, what is happening today and what's going to happen uh, as the pandemic wear off, as the vaccines become, you know, uh, available to everyone. Um, and here in Michigan, uh, I know because I work with, with the state of Michigan, I know that um, the, uh, the state has enacted uh, uh, two policies. One is called the 60 by 2030. Um, um, and the other one is called, I think that's, that's the main policy. So I, I'm, I'm sorry, 60 by 2030. And it includes uh, helping frontliners, front um, frontliners get, get into, into uh, training uh, and they also include another program called Reconnect. And I would like Kerry to uh, take a few minutes and explain to people what these uh, programs are and how her organization is involved in achieving these programs. Thanks, Leo. These are certainly heavy hitting policies that are pretty progressive for Michigan in terms of the outreach and the outcomes that they want to achieve. So as Leo said, um, the goal of 60 by 2030 is to increase the number of working age adults with a skills certificate or a college degree from 45% that we see today all the way up to 60% by 2030. So that's a pretty aggressive um, percentage that they want to see an increase in, you know, within the next nine years now. Um, so part of this is they're looking for ways to seek a better Michigan specific specifically in three different ways. So the first thing they want to close that skills gap that really poses that largest threat that we see to, to the haves and the have nots and the economic security that individuals have. Um, they want to also make sure that we're looking for jobs that have a requirement that you can get into and you have the opportunity to have a career pathway or ladder with. So starting out with something that's more entry level and looking for what comes next in terms of that certificate or the next career stuff for yourself. And they really want to increase the opportunities for Michiganders, greater access to the education and skills that require and create those opportunities to really build a better economic Michigan. So the first initiative under this to really support that goal was the Future for Frontliners program that Leo mentioned. So the goal of that program is to offer a chance for individuals who were working on the front lines during the COVID pandemic. Oftentimes that would be a healthcare worker or what we were considering essential workers at the time. So it could be someone who was um, working at the state and working on policy, things of that nature, um, to be able to connect and attend school towards a certificate 
certificate and have us pay for it. It was modeled after the United States GI Bill um, in the way that it was done here in Michigan. And it's really been a fantastic way to see tangible outcomes for people to be able to start to enter schools and trainings. The more recent program that, that was just actually announced is the Michigan Reconnect program. And that's another scholarship program to help individuals be able to achieve their goals. The goal of our agency really to tie into all of those initiatives is to help get the word out. So we've talked about it on Facebook. We've talked about it with all our program participants. We talked about it in articles and in interviews with earned media. So we really wanted to help be a part of getting the voice out for where these opportunities are that will in large part help to, to lead to security here for Michigan for so many people. Great. Um... So, uh, you know, from, from what I know, uh, 80, uh, the last count uh, is that 80,000 front, frontline uh, workers actually uh, have registered for this program to be trained. And so it's really working. Um, so we, we think that with Reconnect, we're gonna have more people outside just those uh, is, uh, essential workers to, to get into these programs. Um, so let's, let's move to other parts of the world and I'm gonna go to Pakistan with Kalim. Um, so I was looking at the CIA World Factbook uh, and it lists uh, Pakistan as the fifth most pop populous country in the world with a population of over 233 million as of July, 2020. About 19% of this population is between the age, the age of uh, 15 and 24 years. Um, so as a young innovator and budding entrepreneur, as well as an advocate for youth welfare, are you aware of any policies or programs the country has undertaken to increase youth employment, particularly in the aftermath of the pandemic? Uh, thank you for the question. And yes, very populous country. <laughs> a lot of people under uh, the age of, of 24. Um, I think I'm going to actually set the background for the question with this sort of caveat. And it's that I think the biggest focus during the pandemic was alleviating the healthcare burden on hospitals and tertiary care centers. And I think pr the primary focus of the government was also towards that which is why there, is, there was a sort of paucity of focus on re-employment or employment increasing strategies, whether that was among elderly, uh, elder people or whether that was among uh, the youth group that you identified. However, uh, there, were, there were a couple of programs that were instituted and I think the most successful of them was the prime minister's uh, Kamyab Jawan Youth Entrepreneurship Scheme. So Kamyab Jawan in, in Urdu means uh, successful youth. Um, and I think the and it, it was primarily aimed at the age group of 21 to 45 year olds who were young entrepreneurs as well as who were uh, existing in business already. And it was sort of designed to provide subsidized funding through uh, three primary pathways. And this was completely under the guidance and supervision of uh, the state bank of the country. And how it worked was that um, these beneficiaries were given loans and the program specifically dedicated a, a quota, minimum quota of at least 25% to women entrepreneurs in this pandemic to promote uh, growth of uh, uh, women led businesses in the country. And um, we're still looking to see how successful this program was, but it was heartening to see uh, the impact that this might have uh, through the coming year, as well as in the next five to 10 years, and if there's any offshoots uh, that can come across of that. Um, we know that the area of tech and software IT is gaining a lot of popularity in the country, which has traditionally been known for um, business, uh, medicine, and law degrees. So um, the movement towards IT and software engineering is something that is heartening to see, and we hope that the government will move towards supporting those fields uh, quite significantly. We have seen this in uh, the private sector significantly, and we hope that this is mirrored across the public sector, and uh, we hope this facilitates the creation of public-private partnerships in higher education and employment moving forward. Thank you. 
Great, great. Those are really good, good programs and, and uh, we're probably going to see that across the globe. Um, we are moving toward the same, the same goals, the same things that we, we, we're doing all over the, the world. So I'm going to uh, uh, ask Mina, um, one of the things that I have noticed as I was looking at statistics is that um, youth unemployment is still relatively high in low-income European countries, especially in the Balkans and Southern Europe. Uh, your organization, as you mentioned, Junior Achievement, Achievement Europe, uh, or GA Europe in short, uh, offers hands-on entrepreneurial programs to prepare young Europeans for future jobs by equipping them with work readiness, entrepreneurship, and financial, fi financial literacy skills. So can you expand a little bit on these programs and how they are affected by the pandemic? So in today's context that we are in, um, we believe that these very practical hands-on entrepreneurial experiences at school are extremely relevant because they really build uh, a wide variety of skills amongst young people uh, from the very concrete uh, sort of business and, and financial literacy skills uh, all the way to um, resilience, which uh, which is really the key uh, skill in today's world, overcoming uh, adversity, disruption, finding opportunity amidst of challenges. So we there's really um, studies showing that uh, young people who have this kind of opportunity while they are at school, it really opens their eyes and they are more likely to, to have a better um, first employment, they are more likely to have a higher salary than peers who have not this opportunity. Um, and they are also more likely to be entrepreneurs. So, so it's really that the need is clearly there. Uh, and we believe that every young person should have uh, such an opportunity. But now in, in, in the context of the pandemic, uh, education systems uh, have also been in crisis. So um, what we've noticed is that there has been rather a concentration on, on core curricula. Uh, especially in compulsory school uh, and all kinds of extra um, educational programs have not been prioritized. And so um, instead of growing uh, year after year, like we, we, we aim to in terms of student numbers, in terms of the, the opportunities we provide to young people, uh, the pandemic has clearly put uh, a stop on that growth and, and, and we we see that some areas indeed uh, in, uh, in, in uh, depending on the geographic area in Europe, but also within different countries, you have regions uh, and areas that have more trouble shifting into this online uh, world. So it goes all the way from really the, the digital tools, the, the availability of them, how well the schools or the families are equipped, um, but also a, a set of other resources, how much support the, the young people can get from home. Uh, and then uh, there is this risk of a growing number of young people um, falling behind. Uh, and, and we really think that all the stakeholders uh, from uh, education, but also from the world of work that we work with closely, should come together and provide increasing uh, opportunities. So there's the need is even more to accelerate uh, these kinds of programs today. Very much appreciated. Um, uh, now uh, to Sazini in 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 so, so, South Africa, uh, but you know I, I'm going to ask you to talk to talk more about Sub-Saharan Africa in general. So we know that um, Sub-Saharan Africa has the youngest population in the world. Uh, in many countries, over sixty percent of the population is below twenty-five years old of age. Um, and also projections over the next 50 years of, and beyond show that Sub-Saharan Sub Africa is the only region in the world displaying significant population growth. So I wanted you to uh, share uh, with us some strategies that your group, APSA, is using to unlock uh, the demographic dividends that come from such a useful and fast growing population, especially as it pertains to the fourth in industrial revolution and opportunities that may exist in the dig digital economy. 
Uh, thank you for that, uh, Leo. And maybe just to add as well, 60% um, of the working of the um, economically active population is unemployed in their youth. Um, and, and over and above that, most of those people, 50% are in the informal sector. So they're already underemployed and they're within the vulnerable groups. So just to, to, to paint a picture, um, more than 10 million young people enter the job market um, every year on the continent, but there are only approximately 3 million jobs. So the problem is quite big. And when we assess the challenges that we're, we're looking at on the continent, we, we also looking at our size as an organization and what kind of contribution we can make. And in identifying some of the big challenges we see on the continent, particularly relating to uh, youth unemployment, access to education, access to skills, we realize that underpinning all of that is access to digital technology. Young people need access to technology. We see that there's, a le there's less focus on trying to get an eight to five o'clock job, but more on trying to be productive. So the gig economy is something that most of them are trying to get into. We encourage entrepreneurship for young people to create jobs and look at their productivity. And so what we have done is to primarily focus on, on supporting technical, vocational and digital skills amongst young people. In all the countries where we were, we're present in about 10, 12 countries on the continent, we have a specific push and a drive to work with the TVET sector. That is the technical vocational education and training sector to get young people to move away from uh, trying to get the formal type of jobs and skills, but rather to look at themselves as um, an asset and their productivity. So we have um, a number of programs, artisanal skills programs, um, as you know, Africa has, is one of the growing uh, continents. So there's a lot of social infrastructure, a lot of infrastructure building that's happening across all our markets. Artisans are needed for that. Um, and we're trying to show young people that is the place where they, the, the, well, that's one, those are one of the skills they need to acquire. Agriculture is another skill set that we are pushing young people towards. When we realize, particularly with the, uh, with the pandemic, one of the critical sectors that remained open and needed was the agriculture sector. And within that, obviously food and the whole distribution system, value chain system of an agriculture sector can drive and create more jobs. So we have also got quite a strong push within that sector. And as a bank, we've got quite a huge market share within the agribusiness sector. So we are also looking at how we engage throughout that value chain to support young people to enter that sector, but get the right mentorship and skills to, to work within the agribusiness. The, second, the third area of focus for us has been digital skills, but that one is the most challenging because there's a lack of infrastructure, tech infrastructure. There's no network in most of um, our countries. It's only in the metros or in the major cities, but most of the young people that we're targeting are not in those areas. They are in the peri-urban areas and in the rural areas. So to try and facilitate access to technology um, I think it's Mina who mentioned how there's even challenge to access to devices and the laptops and the iPads, they can't, they can't get them, let alone understand how to use them. So there is also the lack of resources. And one of the biggest focus areas for us as an organization has been teacher support. We have recognized that in order to move people into the digital economy, young people can try and do that. But the barriers to entry have been the teaching uh, fraternity. They are used to the blackboard and they will use the blackboard. So when you introduce smart boards and try and introduce digital technology, we face huge barriers because the teachers don't move to that. So we have huge programs that we've started working, coalitions that we've pulled together that are looking at how we support the teacher interns, teacher assistants who will gradually facilitate that transition from the blackboards into the digital and, and smart board and um, blended learning solutions. That introduction at a high school level and at a university level becomes very important because you equip that young person to be digitally savvy and understand how to enter the economy and become productive and look at um, selling their skill beyond what they can see beyond their community or their country, but become a global player. 
we have read, we have seen that most young people beyond just being Uber drivers, once they get out, that's not an eight to five job. They also do translation. They do, they teach English overseas online, but that requires access to resources, understanding the digital economy and the skills that are required for that. And also understanding your social media profile to be able to sell yourself. So those are little skills that are required, but are so important when we're looking at the digital age and the economy. When we look at tertiary education and how we can try and break those barriers, we are starting to focus on huge partnerships with the Amazon Academy, for example, uh, teaching young people to code. They don't need to be in university to do that, but we need uh, academies that can support that skills development. And the, the entries into those kind of skills is quite, is quite simple. And for us, I think the biggest challenge is that they have to be demand-led skills, but the opportunity is beyond your immediate environment, beyond your country, the opportunity is global. So we have really focused on trying to move young people and advancing them into the digital economy, digital skills training, um, and, and helping them with life skills to realize that their um, capability is beyond a degree. It is actually the skills to navigate a global economy and have access to it. And organizational size is looking at how we can then facilitate access to the technology, access to digital, uh, equipment, devices for them to be able to do that. And more importantly, the life skills required to operate in a digital world and how to manage your own digital footprint. So that's the focus for us. And we do see that beyond the big labor absorbing sectors, like your agriculture, your services sector, the hardest hit sector, hit sectors where your tourism, hospitality, transport. So those will take a while to get up and they have actually led to more jobs being lost in the market. So the upskilling and cross-skilling initiatives that we've involved in are really driving a demand-led digital skills approach for our young people. And we Great. do see that as a big change for, for driving um, the shift. Yeah, it sounds like you've actually uh, talked about different things that we wanna talk about in the next uh, round of discussions. Um, and in the sake of saving time, so we have more time for um, Q&A at the, at the end. I would ask, I would like, I would ask um, each panelist to be a little bit faster and a little bit short in their answers. I want to be specific, really, to different programs that you you you're working on as an organization. And so, uh, again, I'm going to go to Kerry um, uh, and ask uh, a specific question about uh, the Michigan State University's. Global Youth Investment Network program that he has with you. Um, uh, that they, uh, the program puts you in contact with a few students from their program uh, for the Summer Solutions Mentorship Project. project. Could you, in a view, few words, uh, could you explain a little bit about that project for us? Thanks, Leo. That was a specific program that we received funding for to encourage youth to be engaged in work experience opportunities and to raise their career awareness for where there's some in-demand jobs. So as a big component of that, we recognize the need for mentors, really having that opportunity to engage with someone who has different experiences than yours, um, to learn from a leadership perspective what steps can be taken. And with that, we were looking for mentors from across the region, and MSU was so helpful in being being able to support mentors to our youth so that they had an opportunity to learn more from that global perspective, what leadership means, what different experiences there are that each of us bring to the table, and where there's some of those commonalities that they can learn from each other with. It was a great experience. Great. I think Devin, uh, uh, didn't you uh, participate in that program? Actually, no, I didn't. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, but so I'm going to go to you anyway and ask um, your opinion on how uh, can businesses and universities help employ young people during the pandemic? And also talk a little bit in a few words uh, about innovative ways you have seen young people uh, use to respond to the pandemic. Right. So, yeah, for the sake of time, I will keep it short. Um, you know, I do think, like I stated in the last question or answer, um, I kind of probably got ahead of myself was that there needs to be a conscious effort to 
you know, uh, meet students in the middle and uh, make opportunities to find, um, you know, teaming with maybe specific, to be more specific, teaming with colleges um, that they feel that, you know, that's where their student audience may be or where their interns may come from um, and come up with a program where the colleges and the uh, companies or organizations can come together to make sure that there aren't people lost or without jobs unnecessarily. Because like I said, you know, we need them and they need us. Um, but um, from my own experiences, based on my peer group, I do believe that there is um, a huge influx of entrepreneurship and creativity. Um, like Ms. Mojapello has um, also stated, you know, there's so much more than uh, just the undergraduate degree. The undergraduate degree is definitely necessary in this world. However, it is not the end all be all. We know that because you have education does not mean that you will have a job and it does not mean that you will necessarily be economically empowered. And I think that people are starting to realize that and they're starting to actually do what they really want to do. Uh, and you see a lot of things like these podcasts, you see a lot of entrepreneurship with people selling goods, uh, you know, and being very creative. And those things are taking off. Um, I can only speak for what I know, you know, especially in the black community. Uh, social media has become a huge part of success and what seems to make people happy. Uh, YouTube uh, is starting to go beyond just entertainment. Uh, so things like that have become very interesting. There is also uh, seems to be a huge influx in with women in uh, aesthetics, or I think they're called estheticians. So providing uh, beauty uh, beauty services to women has become a huge thing in the community. So a lot of people are taking things into their own hands um, and combining their education with also this form of a gig economy, uh, doing what they love and also kind of having fun with it. So people are really starting to become innovative and I'm really curious to see how the world looks in the next 10 years for my uh, generation. Nice. Um, th that's really great. Um, and you mentioned about po po podcasts and um, uh, Sazini Apsa has developed the interchange po 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 podcast series. Um, so if you can expand on this program, just in a few, few, a few words and how it changed since the pandemic, that would be great. I think um, the interchange, uh, what is most significant about it was we supported um, a, a, a youth organization called Simon. They generated the idea and came up with it to set up a debate series between young people and professionals around the key challenges that are facing uh, the country, particularly just focused on South Africa. So they curated a number of programs. The founders of that uh, interchange uh, Gareth Cliff, who's a DJ, and two entrepreneurs. One is 26, the other one is 28, and it took off incredibly. Not only were we able to empower them as young people with their business idea, um, but they actually created a movement around young people understanding what and how they needed to uh, view the world, solutions around it and engagement. It was a very good thought leadership series that we ran, that we ran in partnership with this uh, Simon Youth Group. Nice, great, thank you. Um, uh, Mina, um, uh, GA Europe has a program called NEETS in Entrepreneurship. Uh, can you expand on that uh, for the audience, please? Yes, yeah, so this is um, uh, a project uh, funded by the EEA Norway Grants. It's a public, uh, publicly funded project focusing on four countries, uh, Bulgaria, Romania, Italy, and Spain. So really in the south, south, southern and eastern um, Europe, and it's about um, mentoring and uh, training uh, 1,600 young people who are either in employment, uh, education, or training in these countries um, in order to equip them uh, and be more uh, likely to land a job or an economic opportunity, internship, uh, or even start a business. And there's also uh, some work around 1,000 uh, other uh, young people who are in school, but who risk um, dropping out. So it's also accompanying them and mentoring uh, while they are still at school, uh, making sure that they are able to complete their education. So these uh, and, uh, and some other initiatives we have, these are very small scale. I mean, I talked about 4 million young people we work with, and this is also only a small proportion of the young population in Europe. 
so the, there is huge potential and need to scale uh, up these kinds of initiatives. And what we see um, from our partners from the world of work, so we work with a number of, of private businesses who, who want to support the local communities, the skills development of the next generation, there is an increasing uh, interest and concern about this uh, growing inequalities and really focusing on, on the young people who need it the most. So, so really looking more closely at the target group, uh, focusing on the young people at risk of dropping out or who have already dropped out of, um, of education. Uh, and so I, I am optimistic about the future, but we really need, as it was already mentioned uh, by other speakers, we really need um, the support and commitment from, from all stakeholders. It's not enough to leave it up to the schools or to the young people themselves. They, they really need to see that there are concrete programs and initiatives at large scale that enable them to have these opportunities. And uh, we also see uh, amongst the entrepreneurial ideas uh, in our programs uh, from the young people themselves, we see a lot of social entrepreneurship. Uh, it's really uh, booming. And even in the last year, um, the pandemic has inspired uh, school students to really come up with uh, solutions to, to the specific problems that have been created. So um, huge potential out there, but we really just need to now uh, make sure we have concrete programs that are rolled out. Great. Um, I, I'm going to go to Kalim. Um, uh, Kalim, we have uh, an app called Rinder. Um, and I wanted to ask if you can tell us about the initiative and, and how it has been affected by the pandemic. Thank you. Um, so just a little bit about the app itself. Uh, it came about in 2018 when we were working in a hackathon and we realized as medical students and allied health that a big problem and uh, that happens in the zoom a lot so okay you froze a little bit oh sorry um yeah. so uh, i think so what so the biggest issue we faced was connectivity Mm -hmm. And our hope was to create a platform that would engage students and researchers, not just in academia, but also in industry, like connect students for paid research jobs or connect uh, pharmaceuticals to find researchers in the community who they may or may not have access to through traditional routes or through LinkedIn, Glassdoor, et cetera. We created that platform, but the pandemic, what the pandemic did, it gave us an advantage and a disadvantage. I think the advantage was the, the dynamic shift in digitalization of platforms and connectivity. And that really helped us get the message of our platform out. The ethos was sort of validated. But I think the biggest disadvantage we had was particularly for a new platform, um, it's hard to get uh, the the face-to-face -face marketing that is required on an institution level. So we found that our biggest sort of challenge during the pandemic was not getting students involved but it, or young researchers, but was actually getting faculty, institutional buy-in. Um, we, you know, we had to strategize around packaging, around subscription costs and all those sort of things. And because of that, we've still remained in our sort of beta test phase and we haven't done a full launch uh, yet. We hope to use the post pandemic to really uh, capitalize on the movement forward, particularly in, a, in, a, in the era where vaccine research and uh, infectious disease research is coming up again. And we hope to use that to guide our platform, both in healthcare and non-healthcare related fields um, across the globe. Nice. Um, so uh, we are about to get into Q&A and I would like to ask as, as we get questions, um, I, I, uh, as we get questions from the audience, um, I would ask each of you to really summarize what you see um, in one sentence, share something that individuals or if you prefer institutions can do to contribute to uh, the uh, sustainable development goal eight. Um, so make it uh, a wrap up of a conversation if you wish, if you, if you wish. Um, uh, so, and I will start with uh, Sazini. Um, I would say digital and technological access for all. Great, great. I think that's a good, a good way to go. Um, Kerry? 
I would say flexibility because there's so much that we're still working through and developing. Having flexibility as you design programs and services as an employer is important. Great. Uh, Kalim? Um, I think it's just about uh, having a voice. I think having a voice is the most important thing so that your needs can be adapted by whatever group or institution you're part of. Uh, Devin? I think that there needs to be um, a um, legislative effort to um, kind of uh, educate people on financial literacy across the globe, even uh, not even just here in America, uh, and making sure that um, entrepreneurship and um, self-promotion is um, just as uh, just as um, publicized as education is. How about you, Mina? For to me, it's the, really the the importance of an entrepreneurial mindset. So it's seeing the opportunity in the disruption, and entrepreneurship is about uh, acting upon opportunities and turning them into value for others, whether it's societal value or economic value or cultural value. So I, I hope that every young person out there will will try to see this huge <laughs> disruption and challenge that is a learning moment and that there's something that will come, will be positive for the future. Nice. Um, so uh, I'm uh, looking at, sometimes this um, Zoom is not friendly. I'm trying to look at all the questions that I have here. Um, maybe Alexandra can help me um, so that I don't miss anything. Let's see. Sure, no problem at all. Um, so uh, for all of the panelists, uh, um, for all of the attendees, if you have questions that you'd like one of the panelists to answer, you can put it in the chat at this time. Um, we can get started with, I actually had a question for Carrie since we don't have any from attendees yet. Um, in regard to the 60 by 2030 project, I was wondering if you've identified a few specific industries that are ready to absorb an increase in workforce and if you have, what are they? And are they, is that relevant only to Michigan and our local economy or could um, young people nation or worldwide benefit from pursuing them? It's a great question. So for Michigan, we look at it typically from a regional perspective. So I know with the data sets that Leo's team at the state provides for Department of Management, Technology and Budget labor market information, we are expected to see a lot of growth in our region within the professional skills trade, um, which makes sense given we have Michigan State down the road and we have the capital with a lot of state employees who are here, but also we're seeing huge strides being made in IT, which makes a lot of sense right now because so much has gone virtual. And I think that's something that we're gonna see across the state as well as across the country and across the world. We're not coming out of this pandemic tomorrow. So there's going to continue to be a push for making sure that we have skills that align with technology access Access and digital needs being met um, across the country. And so we are encouraging people to look into those careers because there really are some really short trainings that you can do to get your foot in those careers and then work on building that career ladder. Um, we're also seeing a lot of construction growth so skilled trades are something that we see in apprenticeship opportunities, which aren't that traditional model that you see from attending a four-year university, but seeing where there's some of those shorter term credentials that you can earn and learn on the job um, is where we're seeing a lot of growth as well in our country. Awesome, thanks for that answer. Um, we have another question here that isn't directed to anyone specific. So I'll just ask, and if anybody has something that specifically comes to mind, you can jump in. Um, how do you see universities helping you transition out of COVID? Does anybody have a thought on that? I do from my perspective. So we work a lot with universities to help individuals obtain their credentials. And they're gonna be critical credentials to help people get into positions of employment, which is always going to be better for the economy. But also looking at it from a partnership perspective, MSU is a critical, partner in the region that I work within. So having them at the table to make sure that we're designing and aligning programs and skills to meet the needs of the employers in our region is really critical. We all have to be at the table, as Kaleem said, and have that voice to really make sure that there's connections between what we're doing. 
Awesome. Anybody else? Colleen, go ahead. Yeah, um, I can sort of add to the, I can add to the point by uh, sort of giving the perspective of a medical university. I think at least here, and I think all over the world, we saw a big uh, influx of research and innovation that was coming out of universities that was directly impacting businesses, uh, economic decision making, um, and actually uh, transport, uh, transport and uh, travel across the country. And I think that's really where universities can help. I think while the employment and education sizes conversation has been covered by all the speakers, I think those are other areas really where universities can play a role in providing that data, providing a workforce and providing um, just uh, like Carrie said, you know, having that seat at the table, having that voice where uh, rational, log logical decisions can be made to impact a country's economic uh, trajectory and um, overall healthcare and wellness. Great. Um, I don't see additional questions at this time, and I know that we're running towards the end. So I think I'd like to transition to Chinwei now to uh, close us out. Wow, <laughs> that was amazing. Thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone. I, I was just stunned by how we went from the challenges, very real personal challenges and professional challenges, and quickly pivoted to what you were already doing to address those challenges. Some of the, the highlights for me were be prepared, be aggressive, change your approach, think outside the box, seek opportunities around the world. Um, these are real tangible um, suggestions and models, and as well as all of the different activities that you're either advocating through your government or working with parents at home to support their children, all of these are just amazing. Thank you. I want to thank each and every one of you for such a thoughtful conversation and taking the time, um, different time zones uh, around the world to be here. I want to thank Dr. Miramba for, for moderating this session. Thank you so much. I know a lot of preparation went into it. I want to thank the Jan team, um, specifically Alexander and Elizabeth, who worked on all the logistics. And thank all our viewers for watching and um, stay tuned for our next Global Voices webinar. Great. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.